Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do a video that kind of ties in with my obsession with the Pulitzer Prizes. I've been doing a lot of thinking because I released my predictions video for the Pulitzer Prize for 2022. I will put a link to that video in the description box down below, but spoiler for that video, I talk about a lot of possible books that could win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction this year. And the book that I'm predicting, and that I think a lot of people are predicting, is The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole complicated thing that's been going on in my head, because I, I alternately hear her referred to as a debut novelist, because this, this is her first novel, but she is a published author. But something about that conversation got me thinking about debut authors who have won the Pulitzer Prize. I don't want to get into the debate about whether or not she counts as a debut author because I'm really, in this video, only going to focus on people whose very first published book won a Pulitzer Prize. And unless she actually becomes a winner, I don't have to settle whether or not she would qualify for that. But largely, I, in this video, I'm just going to talk about people who won a Pulitzer Prize for the first book that they published. By the way, I should mention, I did close <laughs> one of the drapes a little bit behind me because the sun is being obnoxious. But at least that means it's getting warmer. Whatever. So I have eliminated people like Oliver Lafarge, who wrote Laughing Boy, his first novel that won a Pulitzer Prize, but he had previously published a book that was nonfiction, and therefore I am not including him in this video. But I want to look at the debut novelists that have won a Pulitzer Prize and see if they lived up to the potential of that big award that came with their first book. And I think this is a really interesting conversation. Another author that won a Pulitzer Prize for their debut novel that I am not really going to talk about is John Kennedy Toole for A Confederacy of Dunces because this to me is a very specific case. John Kennedy Toole had written A Confederacy of Dunces, tried to get it published, and was rejected. He suffered from depression and you can't blame the fact that he wasn't able to get a confederacy of dunces on his ultimate suicide, but he did kill himself. And his mother took the manuscript and spent years trying to get people to read it, and she ultimately got it published, and it went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. So I don't think his narrative fits the discussion of the rest of the authors that we're going to talk about, because he had already passed on by the time this book was published. So there's obviously no chance that he would have gone on to a writing career, which I think is unfortunate. He was clearly a great talent. They did subsequently release a book that he had written when he was only 16 years old called The Neon Bible. But again, that was something that had been written before this and was only published after his death. So he couldn't really go on to a writing career in the way that these other authors were able to. So he's just sort of like an honorary mention or like an addendum to this conversation, kind of similar to Oliver Lafarge for Laughing Boy. Now, what's interesting is that it used to be a lot more common for a debut author to win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. There are 11 authors that qualify under the metrics that I have given where it had to be their first published book that they won a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for. And only three of those authors have been awarded a Pulitzer Prize since 1962. There are four, if you count John Kennedy Toole. As I've mentioned, he doesn't really fit the criteria for what I'm doing here. So he's more of an addendum. But interesting that, again, out of the 11 people who have done it, only three have been since 1962. All of the others were before that. In fact, most of them were a stretch in the 1930s. And I wanna go in chronological order, so we're gonna talk about the debut author that happened first, and then we'll move into the present day because it's a lot easier to talk about the authors who are more familiar, so let's work our way from the beginning. But interestingly, it's easier to talk about the authors who are more familiar because they are writing in the present day, but it's more difficult to tell what kind of legacy they're going to leave. So it's also easier to talk about the authors who have come and gone already because you can really tell what kind of a legacy they ultimately did have. The first debut author to win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, again, under the criteria I'm using, is Margaret Wilson for The Able McLaughlin's. I have this beautiful 
Franklin Library edition of it. You'll see a couple more Franklin Library editions as we go through this video. You could argue that because the publishing world was a lot smaller in the 1920s and the 1930s, it was probably easier for a debut author to work their way into the Pulitzer Prize. But I don't really want to get into the mechanics of debating what caused it to become less common over time. Let's just focus on what happened to Margaret Wilson after the Abel McLaughlins was published and won the Pulitzer Prize. She ultimately published eight novels, one novel for children, and a nonfiction book. Her last novel, The Law and the McLaughlins, was a sequel to the Abel McLaughlins, and it was published 13 years later. I'm going to give you a quote from her Wikipedia page that seems to sum up the way her writing career ultimately went. Her novels have been disparaged for a variety of weaknesses, and almost all her plots rely too heavily on coincidence. Her sharp sociological observations provide valuable insight for students of cultural history. However, in addition, her strengths as a novelist are evident in the detailed naturalistic portraits of the daily lives of her characters and in her inability to involve the reader in the problems her characters face. That same Wikipedia page also mentions that her later books are described as romantic melodramas. There's not a whole lot of information about Margaret Wilson on the internet. She is definitely someone who did not leave a whole lot of a cultural footprint. Without the Pulitzer Prize, she might be a forgotten author completely, which is one of the reasons I think it's interesting to go back and read these Pulitzer Prizes, because you discover authors like her who had a moment in the sun and then kind of faded away. And of the authors we're going to talk about, she's probably the one that has the least information available online, at least at a quick look, because I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time doing research for this video. And I don't know enough about her, and I haven't read this book, and I haven't read any of her others, so I can't speak to the quality of them yet. I am going to get to this one. But it seems like she is probably someone who fell into the trap of what traditional literary criticism values in an author. In her debut novel, she scored points for everything that I mentioned in that blurb from the Wikipedia page, where she had sharp sociological observations and insight about cultural history. Maybe she hadn't built up a brand. If this had been one of her later books, maybe she would have been associated more with romantic melodrama. But it feels a little pointed that romantic melodrama is the thing people signal out as something to deride her later work. She did live until 1973, but the last thing she published was that children's book that I referenced, which was published in 1939. Her last novel was 1936, and it was the sequel to this. So she went on and had a whole life outside of writing, and perhaps that is ultimately what made her fade from the pop cultural footprint. So in this case, I think it's fair to say that this is an author who did not live up to the promise of winning a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction on their debut novel. However, when I ultimately get around to doing my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on the Abel McLaughlins, I do look forward to spending more time learning about Margaret Wilson, what she did in all those years after she published her last, last book and before she died, and uh, how her reputation developed over time as she published further books because it seems like there's a bit of a fascinating story there and I'm just kind of dipping a toe into it right now. It's a lot easier to talk about Caroline Miller who won a Pulitzer Prize for Lamb in His Bosom which was her debut novel and she won the 1934 prize which means this was published in 1933 and again I have one of these beautiful Franklin Library editions of this book. The reason her story is a lot easier to talk about is that Caroline Miller kind of went on record as saying that she found the attention that accompanied literary success and specifically winning a Pulitzer Prize uncomfortable. She didn't like it. She ultimately only published one other novel, which was called Lebanon, 11 years later, and it debuted to mixed reviews. She continued to write in the last decades of her life. She ultimately died in 1992, but she never tried to have any of those manuscripts publish. And I think that goes to show that she found success and attention didn't really suit her in her life. She much preferred to write for herself. And that's what she did with the rest of her life. And good for her for claiming her joy in life and being a writer on her own terms. It means that ultimately she didn't fulfill the promise from the, an audience perspective, but she certainly seems to have met it on her own terms. And again, good for her. Congratulations. <laughs> 
The next debut novelist to win a Pulitzer Prize was Josephine Johnson for Now in November and again another Franklin Library edition of the book. Josephine Johnson has another distinction in that she is currently the youngest person to win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. She was only 24 when she won for Now in November. And again, she seems to have lived her life outside of the spotlight. She ultimately published 10 books in total. She found her greatest success after Now in November with short stories. She won several O. Henry prizes for those stories, and she released a couple of collections scattered around the years. Her last book was published in 1974, and she ultimately died in 1990. So again, there's a big gap toward the end of her life where she wasn't writing, or at least not publishing, and she seems to have married and she raised her children, so that seems to be her priority, and you can't fault her for that. And one of the other things that I found interesting in preparing for this video is that it seems like that is the case with a lot of the women authors who won these prizes. They had a life outside of writing that involved family life and more quiet things, and it was existed outside of the media, which means it's tempting to say that she didn't live up to the promise because she ultimately didn't have too much of a cultural footprint, but she certainly published throughout several decades and seems to have had a life of her own and on her own terms, and again, good for her. And that is going to be kind of the case for the next one, even though he is a male writer. It's Harold L. Davis who won his Pulitzer for his debut novel, Honey in the Horn. He won in 1936, and his book was published in 1935. This is where we are in that stretch where debut novelists win in consecutive years in the 1930s. He ultimately published nine books in his career, but he didn't even attend the Pulitzer Award ceremony because he felt like he was going to be putting himself on display if he did so, and he did not want to do that. He focused on other things during his life after his win, and he published short stories for a couple of years whenever he needed money, just doing odds and ends here and there. He would sell them to a magazine. He also released a book of poetry, and six years later he did release another novel called Harp of a Thousand Strings, but because he had stepped out of the spotlight rather deliberately and not capitalized on the success of the Pulitzer win, he really deliberately waited a couple of years, it meant that he lost a lot of the fanfare, so Harp of a Thousand Strings failed to get a whole lot of attention, and so did his subsequent works. But again, it seems like being part of the literary world and having audience attention and all of that stuff was not where his priority was. He chose to focus on other things, so good for him. The following year, we got another debut novelist that won a Pulitzer Prize, and I've done a whole video on this already. It's Margaret Mitchell and Gone with the Wind. I've said pretty much everything there is to say about it in that video. I'll put a link to it down below because I've done my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on this book. Margaret Mitchell ultimately never published another book, but it doesn't really matter because the success of Gone with the Wind was so enormous that it is still a popular book today. And while people might not know the name of the author as much, she has pretty well secured a lasting legacy, for good or for bad, I would say mostly for bad. According to Margaret Mitchell, she never published another book because she didn't have time. That's probably true to a degree. It's easy to speculate as well that she probably felt crushing pressure to live up to the wild, wild success of Gone with the Wind. But since she didn't really talk about it publicly, you don't really know why. But ultimately, Gone with the Wind is the only book she ever published. She died in 1949 after being hit by a drunk driver. Perhaps if she had lived longer, she ultimately may have published something else. We'll never know. After that, there's a decade gap between Margaret Mitchell and the next debut author that won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and that's James A. Michener, who won the 1948 Pulitzer Prize for fiction for Tales of the South Pacific. I don't have the facts, I haven't done the research, but I believe this work is particularly of note in the Pulitzer Prize for fiction canon because I believe it is a property that has won a Pulitzer Prize in two different categories, not for James Mishner, but it was adapted into the musical South Pacific, which went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Now, South Pacific, the musical, is loosely adapted from Tales of the South Pacific. I haven't read this one yet, so I can't say how loosely adapted. Fact remains, it is a musical that won a Pulitzer Prize for drama, that was adapted from a novel that won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and that kind of gives it a unique distinction in the Pulitzer Prize universe. 
James A. Michener is probably the biggest success story of debut novelists who won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Again, Margaret Mitchell has had a huge cultural impact with her one book. We'll get to another author that has had a huge cultural impact off of just one book. But James A. Michener went on to have a huge writing career. He was a literary sensation and a best-selling author for decades. He sold 75 million copies of his books worldwide. He published 25 novels and numerous works of nonfiction. Several of those works were also adapted and successfully, including South Pacific, which we've already talked about, The Bridges at Tokori, Sayonara, and Hawaii. So he did really well for himself and again, because he went on to such a huge publishing career, he is probably the most successful debut novelist who has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It was a while before another debut novelist won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. The next time was 1960 when Alan Drury won for Advise and Consent. Alan Drury had had a successful career in Washington as an advisor. He used that experience to form Advise and Consent. It was a big smash success in the publishing world. It was also adapted into a movie, and it was also adapted for the stage. Alan Drury used the success of Advise and Consent to pivot away from journalism and politics to focus on publishing, and he went on to a career where he wrote in a variety of genres. He dabbled in science fiction a little bit. He certainly did not have the success that James A. Mishner did, he is less recognizable of a name as, say, James A. Michener and even Margaret Mitchell. However, he definitely used the success of Advise and Consent and the accompanying Pulitzer Prize to make exactly the kind of writing career that he wanted, so he is certainly a success story. And we didn't have to wait too long for another debut author because the following year, Harper Lee won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for To Kill a Mockingbird. In my mind, this is her only novel. Shortly before she died, a publisher secured the rights to Ghost at a Watchman, which was basically the original version of To Kill a Mockingbird. There's a flashback in that to uh, the Ma Pro Scout's childhood, and a probably genius publisher told her to expand on the childhood, and that is how we ended up with To Kill a Mockingbird. In my mind, Ghost at a Watchman does not exist. Harper Lee had not intended for it to be published, and I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty details of how Ghost of the Watchmen came to be published doesn't sit well with me. So I'm going to pretend that she only ever really published this in her lifetime. She did think about other works, never really got anything off the ground. She kind of struggled with the idea of how to follow up on such a wild success. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter that she didn't publish anything else because this book is an American classic. And in my mind, a much better classic than Gone with the Wind, which I had a whole video about again. I haven't done my deep dive on To Kill a Mockingbird. I want to reread it because I enjoy rereading it. So she secured a legacy without publishing anything else. She did just fine. Now this is where we get into the really big gap after Harper Lee won her Pulitzer Prize for fiction. The next one is John Kennedy Tool. And again, I don't think he kind of meets the criteria unfortunately. I would love it if he had been able to have a writing career after the Confederacy of Dunces, but it's not the way it worked out. So if we take that one out of the equation, we go from 1961 to 2000, when Jhumpa Lahiri won a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for her debut novel, which is a collection of short stories called Interpreter of Maladies. It is one of my favorite short story collections. I know a lot of people are iffy on short story collections. I like them, and this is a good one in my mind. And Jubal is doing just fine. After this, she went on to publish The Namesake, which is a wild bestseller. She went on to publish Unaccustomed Earth, which is a combination of short stories and a novella, I believe. And then she published The Lowland and now Whereabouts. She's doing just fine. Jim Lahiri has become a reliable name in publishing. People rely, can count on her to sell books and count on audiences to be interested in her books. And she has done really great in her career after winning the Pulitzer Prize for her debut novel. It would be interesting to see what would happen in an alternate universe where she did not win a Pulitzer Prize for this. I think the namesake probably still would have become 
a bestseller, it might have just been a bit of a tougher sell without that Pulitzer Prize to back up Jhumpa Lahiri. And then again, it is 10 years before we get another debut novelist who won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and that's when we get the surprise winner, Paul Harding and his novel Tinkers, which won in 2010. Surprising everybody, the New York Times had not even done a review of Tinkers when it won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. They sort of had to catch up really caught a lot of people by surprise it was a very unknown book i believe it even came from an independent publisher and i remember i was working at borders when it won the pulitzer prize and we couldn't even get it in stock for several weeks because it was such a small publisher and it was such an unknown book that they had to scramble to catch up with the print demand that came with winning a pulitzer prize Paul Harding has only published one other book since Tinker's, and that's Enon. I have an advanced reader's copy that I got at Book Expo when I was still working in publishing. He has definitely maintained a low profile in the literary world. I really don't know much about him. Again, there's not a whole lot of information about him online. So it seems like that's what he wants. He doesn't seem to really want to dive into the wider cultural spotlight. And that's fine if that's what he wants. But it's also difficult because since it's only been 12 years since Tinker's, you don't really know what kind of a legacy he's going to have. But we'll get into the thing that complicates that in a moment. What I will also say is, like I said, I got an advanced reader's copy of Enon, the follow-up to Tinker's, which I believe even has characters from Tinker's that show up. I met Paul Harding. He signed this book to me, to Greg. Enjoy, Paul Harding. I don't remember him. In fact, I didn't even remember that this book was signed until I was redoing or working in my bookshelves and organizing stuff maybe a year or two years ago. I had completely forgotten that I had a signed copy of this book and then I was thinking, did I meet him? I must have met him. He signed it to me. <laughs> so funny little thing, but it feels like that's what he wants. So you can't really fault him for it. but. The thing that complicates the idea that you don't really know what kind of legacy he's going to have because it hasn't been long enough is the next debut novelist to win a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, Viet Thanh Nguyen, who won for The Sympathizer in 2016. It's been only six years since he won his Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and he has really made a splash in the publishing world. Not only has Viet Thanh Nguyen published another book, The Committed, which was on a lot of people's best of lists for last year, but he's now on the board for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. That means he is one of the people who gets to decide who will win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. He's doing great. He has also done a lot of work to support other Asian and Asian American authors. One of the books that I've really enjoyed over the, in recent years was The Best We Could Do by T. Bui. This is a graphic memoir and she thanks Viet Thanh Nguyen in her acknowledgments for helping support her and give her advice in her career and through the shaping of this book. And he gave a blurb on the back flap of it. In fact, he is illustrated into the book in the beginning because she frames a conversation that she has with him in the book, which just goes to show that he is even having a sort of ripple effect on other authors and on the publishing industry itself. Again, in only six years since he won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. He even got a MacArthur Genius Grant in 2017. So it's tempting to say that you don't really know what the legacy of someone who is currently publishing will be, but Jhumpa Lahiri is doing just fine in the 22 years since she won her first Pulitzer, and Viet Thanh Nguyen is doing great in the six years since he won his. So those are the debut novelists who won a Pulitzer Prize for their first book. And again, my criteria for this is that they did not publish anything else, not a nonfiction book, not a poetry book or anything like that. And Scott Momaday, Housemaid of Dawn is another exception. He had published uh, a book of poetry before winning the Pulitzer Prize for Housemaid of Dawn. And to me, that excludes him from this conversation. I'd love to hear what you think of these authors, these books, any of the conversation points that we have had as we have gone through this video. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.